Um, thank you so much uh, for coming to the China <coughs> session. Um, it's really good to see that we have a full house here. Um, so I know that we already have a long day and there's a lot of food for thoughts. Um, so we will try to make this section interesting. Um, thank you, um, Evan, for flying all the way from Chicago and Yiping for flying all the way from Beijing. Um, and um, I think it will be interesting to see that, you know, Evan, you look at China from US and, um, you know, Yiping, you are from Beijing. We will see if you two speak the same language. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, hope that we don't need to raise our voice too much. <laughs> so I, I think, um, you know, when uh, my name is Chen, um, I am a Stanford alumni, so it's really good to be back home and join this wonderful event. Um, I mean, for many years, China has been a puzzle, right, for foreign investors. You know, for the past four decades of impressive growth and development, some say it's a miracle, but others say, hey, when the hot landing is coming, you know, the growth model is not sustainable. We thought as time goes by, we should get a better idea. But on the contrary, actually China has become more puzzling in recent years. I would name just a few. The first one I think is about the growth and financial risk. You saw that GDP growth more than halved ever since the financial crisis and the leverage ratio surged. That's not a good combination, and some people say a Minsky moment is coming, um, but still, everything looks in good control. And some economists actually were saying that China's economy is entering a new era of development, the so-called new cycle. So who is right? The second puzzle, I would say, is probably about the domestic policy setting. I remember four years ago, um, the party actually laid out a grand plan for market-oriented reforms. That actually excited all the economists like us. But four years passed. Um, we are still waiting for major breakthroughs. So will China reform or not? And who's actually making decisions nowadays? The third one, I would say, is probably more involved with the foreign relation. As you can hear from Condi this morning, China is becoming more proactive. They have been keeping a low profile for 30 years, but now they are being more proactive, being more assertive, as you can see from the One Belt, One Road project, the Asia Infrastructural Investment Banks. So, you know, what is China trying to do here? And um, how is this perceived by the rest of the world? So, you know, given all those puzzles and uncertainties in mind, we are really glad to have two esteemed speakers um, to help us here to solve those puzzles. So we have, um, you know, Dr. Yiping uh, Huang. Uh, he's the Jinghua Chair Professor of Economics and Deputy Dean of the uh, National School of Development in Beijing University. And he's also a member of the Monetary Policy Committee uh, in the People's uh, Bank of China. So it would be interesting to learn how they make policy. Um, Professor Huang actually received his PhD in economics from Australian National University. Uh, he was previously managing director and chief Asia economist for Citigroup, uh, director of the China Economy Program um, at the Australian National University and policy analyst at the Research Center for Rural Development at the State Council uh, in China. Now, uh, Dr. Um, Evan um, Feigenbaum is the vice chairman um, of the Parson Institute at the University of Chicago, uh, leading the research on Chinese economy. Um, Evan is also a Stanford alumni, right? Actually, one of his advisors is actually Kandi. Yes. Yeah, so his PhD is in China politics. <coughs> Um, during Bush administration, he served as the U.S. State Department as Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, of State for South Asia and Central Asia, as well as member of the policy planning staff uh, with principal responsibility uh, for <coughs> East Asia, uh, and also uh, under, uh, under the Secretary Powell and Rice, and as an advisor on China to Deputy Secretary uh, Zoilek. So without further ado, um, I would uh, like to 
um, probably ask Yiping um, to start first um, to give us uh, some good idea about where China, uh, the economy, and the financial system. Okay, well, thanks uh, for the introduction, and it's uh, really an honor to be here. Um, you probably should not expect uh, um, Evan and I would have the uh, same views. It's very That's rare. Good. Um, if it happened, it would be an accident. Uh, because back at my university, um, at our school, um, we are relatively a small school, and we, the, the, the faculty members almost disagreed on everything. Uh, we talk about the Chinese economy, so um, not to mention other big issues, um, including the topic we are, we're going to discuss today. The new normal, um, I'm going to focus on the, the economy side. In fact, the, um, the first time when the new normal of the Chinese economy uh, was raised um, in the policy document, our school convened, um, convened a, a meeting of the scholars to discuss what exactly it means uh, by new normal. Um, we spent half a day debating among, our, among ourselves and couldn't reach a consensus view. Uh, so our conclusion, our takeaway from the meeting was, well, we don't know exactly what new normal is, but the one thing is for sure, things will be different uh, from the past. Um, but the 19th Party Congress um, actually had a more specific definition about the new normal or the new era of development. That is, the policy focus should gradually be shifting from uh, uh, quantity of growth to quality of growth. Um, um, the government also is uh, focusing on um, the demand for um, better life by um, the people and uh, focusing on resolving some of the issues like what they call the unbalanced and uh, um, inadequate um, development issues. To me, so this is, I think, the simplest way to think about it is now the government will pay less attention to gross numbers, gross rate, but to focus more on the welfare of the people and uh, our living standard. I will highlight three issues, three aspects of this uh, shifting towards the new normal. I, I think it will be important, but, uh, but, uh, but I'm sure there are many other features will be very important in this whole process as well. The first is growth slowdown. Um, that is what we're already seeing and in 2010, growth rate, GDP growth was above 10%, and now we're looking at a number below 7%, and that's a very persistent uh, slowdown. It's rather unique. And again, I mean, uh, my colleagues, we actually had a number of debates about whether this slowdown is a structural or trend slowdown, um, and uh, we ha always have a heated debate. And I myself have the third view. Um, I think a cyclical and a trend factors are important in driving uh, the slowing of the economy at the moment. But the most important driver of a slowdown is what we call the middle income trap question. So China has reached um, a, a, an income level, it's a little bit over 8,000 US dollars from about $300 at the beginning of the reform. The cost base is very different the key challenge is, well, whatever we did very well in terms of developing manufacturing industry, forming competitives in, in competitiveness in international market, these are all gone now. We needed to develop new industries to drive Chinese growth. And that is already in the process, but that's not done yet. So my own view is that growth may continue to slow. We not hit the bottom yet. Only until this tra transition, from old industry to new industry is done. We can talk about the bottoming and maybe pick up a little bit. But this is still an ongoing process. That's my first point. The second point is rebalancing of the economy. Um, if, you, if you talk to a foreign investor, and Chen can tell you, uh, before the global financial crisis, to a foreign investor, what would be the biggest problem of the Chinese economy? Everybody would tell you, um, the, the structural imbalances. Um, and that was a very common knowledge. And today, if you ask somebody, they probably will give you a different term called high leverage. But imbalance was a big problem in China in the previous uh, stage of development. 
Part of the reason was what I call asymmetric liberalization of the market. So China is in the process of transitioning from central plant system to a market system, but the approach the government adopted was kind of asymmetric. On the one hand, the product market has been completely liberalized, almost completely liberalized, but the factor markets remain heavily distorted in terms of pricing, in terms of allocation. Um, a quick uh, explanation, my own explanation why that happened was because we had a dual track uh, reform approach. We maintained the state-owned enterprises, but facilitated the faster growth of the non-state-owned companies. But state-owned companies are relatively less efficient and you need some kind of uh, support. The government didn't have enough fiscal revenues to support the SOEs, so what they did was to distort, intervene in the factor markets. Labor market, capital market, land market, energy market, water market, almost everywhere you can see the government regulations, restrictions, and so on. The, the simplest way to characterize such intervention is it's an effective subsidy by households to the companies. So to push, pushing down the cost of, of input and allocate more resources toward the areas where the government wants to support. If you agree that this is kind of effective uh, subsidies to the companies and effective taxes on the household, then you probably would agree why we had a big imbalance problems because the cost of production, export, and investment were artificially pushed down. And so incentives were exaggerated. But the consumption um, household income as a share of GDP was declining. So you, what you find for quite a while was uh, in, uh, the shares of export and investment in GDP was rising, and the biggest number we saw we saw in 2007, current account surplus, was almost 12% of GDP, and everybody talking about the undervalued the Chinese currency. Consumption share was gradually uh, declining. But these are already changing now, partly because we saw in the labor market, for instance, the wages rising drastically, and that distortion actually is quickly disappearing. Even in the financial industry, distortions remain, but you hear stories about shadow banks and you hear stories about what we call internet finance or uh, fintech. These uh, cause some problems, but in a way, these are like a backdoor liberalization of the interest rate and the financial resource allocation. So what you already start to see is after the global financial crisis, growth is slowing down, but the economic structure is rapidly being um, balanced. And uh, one big number you should, we should look, all look at is we always say that export, the, the, the current account surplus was too large, but today it's only al around 2% of GDP, and I don't think this is actually a big number anymore. The other thing is having a big impact on the economy is the consumption share of GDP continue to rise. In fact, after the global financial crisis, you start to see consumption is becoming a big story. And my own view is it's going to become the next global story um, if it continues. So rebalancing is happening, but it could happen further because consumption share of GDP at the moment is still only slightly above 50% of uh, percent, and the consent can certainly go higher. The third factor um, issue, which is also attract a lot of attention, is the financial risks. And the policymakers are very worried that financial crisis is something we need to work on to prevent. Um, but you look at the last 40 years, China was very successful um, in two senses. Number one, growth was really very strong. And uh, number two, China was probably one of the few major emerging market economies that haven't experienced the, a big financial crisis. Why? Uh, I thought there were two key factors. One was uh, continuous strong growth actually was very useful for absorbing and sometimes covering up some of the problems you create during the process. But the second issue was also very important, implicit guarantee by the government. And so that's why in 1997, the non-performing loan ratio in the banking sector was almost 40%. 
but there was no bank run because the government actually had an implicit guarantee. So the government actually had a time to clean up the balance sheet, to inject the capital, list in the stock market and restructure the bank. So these are actually very large bank and a very profit bank, so profitable bank. So the implicit guarantee was useful. Both of these two factors are changing. Number one, as I, we already discussed, growth is slowing down very quickly. It's creating a lot of problems. Um, and uh, balance sheet at the micro level is deteriorating. Um, financial risk is rising. At the, on the other hand, um, the government's capability in continuing the implicit guarantee is also weakening very rapidly. In fact, uh, um, the Bank of International Settlement created a term a couple of years ago called uh, risky uh, trinity. It <laughs> trying to describe a macroeconomic situation in which number one, um, efficiency is declining, number two, leverage ratio is rising, and uh, number three, government's uh, flexibility room to further uh, mitigate these risks is sub substantially reducing. And I'm sure you all would agree, after a while of government implicit guarantee, the moral hazard problem will continue to rise. So all these point to the fact that we need a market discipline, but we also need to improve regulatory uh, framework. But the risk is rising, and that's something the government is working very uh, closely. So these are the three key features, in my view, that we should all watch very closely um, in the next couple of years. This is a part of the story about the transitioning to the new normal of the Chinese economy. I probably should stop here. Okay. Um, Yitin, thank you so much. I, I think uh, when we talk about the new normal of the Chinese economy, um, it marks lower growth, but probably more balanced growth. And, uh, you know, we are still in the transition period, mm. um, so we probably wait a bit longer before the growth hit the bottom, but the transition is not the transition is not impossible, but certainly not without risk, right? right? So I, I think to a certain extent, um, it's actually quite a challenge for policymaker China uh, to achieve a smooth rebalancing because it looks like the margin for error is quite small, right? So for financial investors like us, we, you know, when we look back, like in 2015, we still <coughs> remember uh, that the stock market uh, slump and also the renminbi depreciation uh, is translating uh, global market volatility, right? So I think policy risk is certainly something that we need to watch for, right? So Evan, you know, you focus a lot on China's policy. Um, what do you think about that? Right. Um, so first, let me say it's great to be back at Stanford. I'm 21 years past my PhD, but every time I come here, I'm eternally 25 <laughs> as I walk around. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I actually agree with a lot of what he thinks said. So okay. I think for the sake of complementarity, I'm going to come at this a little bit differently than you did sure. so that we're not redundant. I'll talk more about the political system in China. And that's also a backhanded way of allowing me to get at your second question, mm -hmm. which was really about the policy environment and an assertion that you made mm -hmm. in the way you set up the question, which I hear a lot, which is that there were these exciting reform commitments made in 2013 at the third plenum of the 18th Central Committee. And Nothing has happened since then. And I hear this all the time. I hear this from market participants. You hear it in investment conferences. There's no reform in China. Um, I want to come at that by talking about politics. First, because I like talking about Chinese politics. <laughs> Second, because it allows me to assert something to you that you will either accept or not accept. But that is that much of what is at the core of the reform questions in China is not really an intellectual problem. It's a political problem. If you were all with Governor Raimondo after the lunch, she talked about a hard reform in the state of Rhode Island when she talked about pension reform. But 80 to 90 percent of what she talked about was politics. And it got me thinking, you know, China has such a different political system. It's an authoritarian political system with a one-party state run by a communist party on Leninist political principles, but it still has politics. And these reform questions, especially the hard ones, urban residency permits, state-owned enterprises, these things are intrinsically political. They involve trade-offs and choices, sometimes trading one reform off for another, and there are winners and losers in those things. So let me, let me try to take three bites at this. First, um, I'm going to tell you what I think the, the 
the agenda was in President mm -hmm. Xi Jinping's first term and why, I was very struck by your comment that rebalancing is happening kind of organically rather than by design, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I would argue that politics rather than economics was really the, the major agenda in China for the last five years. Second, I want to get at this reform question, and I want to argue to you that reform in China does not mean what mm -hmm. it means to market participants mm -hmm. outside China. It means something else, and by their standard, reforms are happening, they're just not the ones that necessarily implicate foreign firms. And then last, I'll just quickly say something on this post-growth mm -hmm. agenda, because it gets at social welfare, and so it implicates some core political questions. Mm -hmm. All right, um, first, politics. I would argue that the first term of President Xi, he's mm -hmm. now moving into his second of possibly many terms, um, <laughs> um, was really about politics, and that was not just a function of succession, politics, which was important because mm -hmm. President Xi, after all, was the first Chinese leader chosen by his peers. Uh, his predecessors were not chosen by their peers. They were chosen by elders. Mm -hmm. um, there was succession politics, and there's a lot of skullduggery that goes on in, in China, um, but also because of what was inherited in 2012, as I think leaders at the top of the party saw it. Now, I don't have any special insight on what leaders at the top of the party are thinking, but I listen to what they say. And if you listen to what they say, I think a lot of what we saw in the last five years was essentially them delivering on precisely what they said they were gonna do. So what they inherited, if you look at what they've written and said, was the following. First, a system beset by too much corruption. Second, a system in which the line between politics and business had blurred in too many ways. And so many ordinary Chinese looked at the political system and saw it as a venal establishment rather than a system that was delivering responsive and good and adaptive governance. Um, third, a uh, place where reform dividends were being shared uh, unequally or at least distributionally where it wasn't perceived as fair by too many Chinese, thus creating political problems for the party. Uh, and last, not just a question of succession, but institutionally a communist party that, if you were a communist sitting at the top of the party, you might think had begun <laughs> to atrophy and had some problems with discipline and therefore potentially with longevity. So in that environment, I would argue that Xi Jinping and his colleagues stepped into a set of political challenges in which party issues really moved front and center. And I think uh, a lot of what we've seen over the last five years has essentially borne mm -hmm. that out. Um, I sometimes, I'm, I'm being trite here, but I think you know, agenda number one, two, and three all involved the Communist Party and politics. Uh, a cleaner Communist Party, a more disciplined Communist Party, and therefore a potentially more sustainable and more enduring Communist Party. And as I said, I think mm -hmm. For the Leninist leaders of a communist party, those were really principal priorities. Now, one piece of that uh, was to discipline the party itself, and that's why the anti-corruption agenda became so central and really surprising how far it reached. I mean, down at the provincial level in China, mm -hmm. if you follow the new provincial newspapers, you would see, you know, one week, you know, three out of five leaders of the local legislature were decapitated. Another week, the entire pricing department at the NDRC would come down. Traffic cops is really quite far reaching. So there was a lot of shock and awe to this campaign. And that had, I think, an, an interesting effect. Um, but a second piece of this was to restore the party's role as the establishment in China. When I got into studying Chinese politics in the 1990s, there was a lot of talk about um, bringing the business establishment into the party and thereby making it more representative of China's establishment. Mm -hmm. I don't think the current leaders of China really buy that. For them, the party is the establishment. And for that reason, they're really mm -hmm. turning that upside down. And you can see in all sorts of ways the party being pushed out rather than outsiders being co-opted in in ways that were not the case even a decade ago. Party committees being strengthened in state-owned enterprises, the party being pushed into society and into educational institutions. Um, Wang Qishan, who's uh, President Xi's one really closest comrade in arms these days, um, wrote an article a few months ago where he said, Northwest, East, South, and at the center, the party leads everything. Well, we'll talk about what that means if you want, but the reality is disciplining the party and strengthening it, I think, was the core agenda. Now, that matters for reform, 
because some of these hard reforms, like reforming state-owned enterprises, <coughs> um, inevitably implicate politics. I mean, one of the biggest problems, not just with the big central state-owned enterprises, but with the thousands of provincial and local ones, is a problem of external supervision. They don't really have strong external supervision. So one way to deal with that would be to incentivize private ownership through mix, these mixed ownership reforms and to strengthen corporate boards. But these experiments with boards of state-owned enterprises have really not gone very far. I can count on one hand the number of pilots that really have advanced. Instead, rather than seeing boards being strengthened, we see party committees being strengthened, the Communist Party committees within state-owned enterprises. From my vantage point, that's actually a regressive step that doesn't really help uh, to corporatize these SOEs and turn them into commercial entities. And in some ways, ownership is less important, private or state. There are private firms in China that are essentially national champions. There are state firms around the world, like Statoil, that are state-owned firms, but they're run as commercial enterprises. So uh, ownership matters, but what really matters is the environment in which they operate. And strengthening these party committees, I think, sends a very powerful message. All right, that leads to my second point, which is the, the many meanings of reform in China. I hear this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I go on a CNBC show, somebody says to me, oh, there's no reform in China. Um, I think it's funny that people outside China say that because if you listen to what Chinese leaders say, President Xi Jinping in his most recent speech said 1,500 reform measures have been undertaken in the last five years of my first term. Reform has been deepened, the institutional environment for reform is stronger, mm -hmm. and reform is moving forward faster and deeper and broader than ever before. So, What's with this disconnect? How can it be that Chinese leaders are asserting reform is, reform is in full flower, but everybody we know in the markets outside China says, oh, there's no reform. Um, I'd argue that part of the problem is that what reform means in a Chinese political context is not what it means to global market participants outside China. To, uh, those of us outside China, it means market liberalization. And when we say reform, it's a proxy for market liberalization <coughs> measures that we would like to see. That is one meaning of reform in the Chinese political context, but there are at least two additional ones. A second one is administrative measures designed to increase operational efficiency in the economy. And a third is a rebalancing of decision powers and authorities between central government and local levels of government. Now, those second and third definitions of reform f figure very prominently in the way Chinese leaders, policymakers, and bureaucrats talk about reform. And many of the 1,500 measures were about administrative measures, streamlining approvals, getting rid of red tape, things that decrease operational efficiency of the economy, but they don't implicate the market, and they don't implicate the market in the way that foreign firms and foreign investors would like to see. Similarly, for what I would call Chinese-style federalism, um, this includes things like approval power, enforcement power, fiscal power as well. Um, these things, these don't matter to General Electric, but they are reform. And in the Chinese context, they are reform. Um, so by that standard, actually, if you broaden your definition of reform and you have a more, I would say, Chinese definition of reform, mm -hmm. there are reforms happening in China. They're just not necessarily the ones that a lot of us had been hoping for when we read the commitment in 2013 to, as the plenum put it, make the market decisive in allocating resources in the economy. Now, I, I think, it's funny, I'm glad you mentioned factor prices. There are, um, if, I, if I were trying to rack my brain and think, you know, where has the market, where have market measures kind of advanced over the last three, three, four, five years, I'd probably pick out some of the price reforms as an example of where the market is playing a bigger role. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Uh, agricultural commodities like cotton and corn prices have been you know, prices have been liberalized on those. Um, electricity and gas tariffs have been uh, liberalized in some ways. Um, residential water is now priced in a tiered system. So th these things are more market driven. So it is not true, as some assert, that there is no market reform whatsoever mm -hmm. in Xi Jinping's China. But these other two areas, I think, are really prominent and. Um, they really implicate the longer term questions of reform that I think are important institutionally. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanna make the market decisive, then logically the state has to retreat. And that means that the really big question is not about just streamlining administrative mm -hmm. approvals, <coughs> but whether the state can transition from being an administrative state to a regulatory one, rather than being an umpire that basically referees itself. Um, that 
is going to implicate state-owned enterprise reform ultimately, but also the regulatory functions of the state, which he King mentioned in his remarks. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I'm not optimistic about what I see there, but I think regulation is an area that we all need to watch very closely over the next few years. And then that gets to the last point, which is this federalism issue. Um, um, uh, you know, this is not just about fiscal power. There's also enforcement power. You want to enforce environmental standards nationally, you need to centralize standardization and you need to centralize enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, so those things are going to matter. Um, the last thing I'd say, and then I'll stop, is just this issue of a post-growth agenda. Uh, I actually think this is very important in China, and it's um, becoming much more central to the calculations <coughs> of the leadership. And I think that has a lot to do, again, with politics. Um, th there's a pithy line that people used to use about China. They'd say, you know, the deal was you get economic prosperity in exchange for constricted political space. So that works when people are not prosperous, but millions and millions of people in China have become prosperous over 40 years of reform and opening up. And so for those millions, their expectations and demands are not just about material gains, but increasingly mm -hmm. about social ones. Mm -hmm. um, they want drinkable water, clean air, food that you can eat, uh -huh. responsive, even if it's unrepresentative government. And so the fact that Chinese leaders are talking about thing, these things so prominently is both an accurate assessment of what their citizenry is increasingly interested in, particularly the urban citizenry, and also a political challenge that they are laying down to themselves, that we will be able to measure them against five years from now. Uh -huh. Um, the most important thing that I think came out of the 19th Party Congress uh, was actually an ideological adjustment. For 30 years, um, Chinese communists talked about a so-called principal contradiction. Now, being good Marxists, they like to talk about contradictions, Hegelian contradictions, dialectical militarism, dialectical opposition of forces. For 30 years, the principal contradiction that governed policy making in China was Deng Xiaoping's contradiction between mm -hmm. essentially <coughs> economic backwardness, and it was basically backward social production and underdevelopment. The, Xi Jinping did something very important at the 19th Party Congress. He changed the principal contradiction. So the principal contradiction in Chinese communism now is between, as they put it, unbalanced and inadequate development on the one hand, and the people's expectations for a better life. So the emphasis now is on social gains and social goods and public welfare, not just on growth mm -hmm. for the sake of growth and prosperity driven by growth. And that inevitably begins to focus you things not just on anti-corruption for its own sake, but whether the government can produce mm -hmm. clean governance, responsive governance, adaptive governance. So anti-corruption is not just about bringing down tigers, but swatting some flies, the daily corruption that besets people's lives when they go to a hospital, when they deal with a traffic cop. Um, those things are going to matter. And in a Leninist political system that is politically unrepresentative, designing responsive government is, I think, a particular challenge. And that's the big bet that's at the heart of this rather Leninist New Deal, uh, which is that they can deliver a better life consistent with the principal contradiction, welfare gains, responsive governance within the context of this unrepresentative political system. That's what the next five years are going to be about in a lot of ways. And that's what I think a lot of the reform questions are about. Right. So quite apart from the you know, monetary policy mm -hmm. and the interest <laughs> rate, the done the deposit insurance now, all of that, these are really the political questions that are at the heart of reform. And I think the jury is very much out on these. And that's why China's next five years are uncertain from my standpoint. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Evan. Um, I think you know, from like economist perspective, when we talk about reforms, we are looking for any reform that can really improve the efficiency of the uh, capital credit allocation and uh, improve the productivity of the economy. So to that extent, when we talk about administrative reforms that can improve the efficiency and quality, that's great. That's definitely the part of the uh, reform that's welcome. But I think the question is, you know, for the past 30 years, um, you know, 40 years of China's growth and development, we have seen big drivers is coming from the private sector Right, um, the booming of the private sector, and also there is a huge literature in China's economic research that decentralization actually helped 
um, with China growth. Right? <coughs> so now uh, we are seeing that um, SOE is getting stronger. Um, and they are, bec you know, uh, so-called the eldest son of the People's Republic uh, of China. And you were talking about this, uh, you know, federalization that's like a centralization. You know, I, I think the question is, um, how will this affect the efficiency and productivity of China's economy in the future? And also, I think um, we also want to look forward. Are we expecting or more confident that we are going to see more structural reforms down the road that is going to boost up the productivity of the economy down the road, which is, I think, very important to get out of the middle income trap, right? So I think that's probably the first question I want to ask both of you. You know, so what kind of reform shall we expect um, down the road? And what in your mind is actually what China should do? And in reality, what we will get? Um, I, I, I think uh, Evan actually uh, had a very good analysis on the reforms. Um, I had a very similar views. Um, the government actually has undertaken a lot of steps in trying to mm -hmm. um, liberalize in many areas, but uh, some of the key I mean, um, issues are not resolved yet. And I think just to put short, simply, um, SOE reform is probably lagging, um, certainly compared to expectations people form. My expectation after the third plenum of the 18th Party Congress, um, at the time, we all thought the government was talking about SOE reform and the shifting from managing SOEs to only look at the returns to state on capital, which would be a very different model, kind of the Tamasak model mm -hmm. in uh, uh, Singapore. That didn't really happen. Um, so that is an issue, and I agree very much. Um, this is probably why um, investors feel uh, very frustrated. Um, but I make two points. Um, on the one hand, I, I do think it is a very critical issue. Um, and a part of the issue there is uh, um, not so much about uh, maintaining SOEs and so on, but about uh, how do you resolve the, what we call the zombie firms. Um, the, um, the, the zombie firms means these are unprofitable ones and it should be closed down, but they continue to, um, to, to exist. And a part of it uh, actually is related to the SOE problem. In fact, I, we did a number of studies and at one meeting, I went to present it to the premier. Um, at the end of the presentation, he asked, well, are these zombie firms mostly private companies or SOEs? I thought he actually asked the question deliberately. I, I think he, know, he, he, he knew um, what was the problem. Now, to be fair, um, the according to the definition, zombie firms could also be private companies, uh, but mostly as the state-owned companies. So because that issue was not resolved. We are facing a number of problems. I actually think the continu continuation of the zombie firms, number one, uh, makes it very difficult for the industrial upgrading. So you look at the Chinese economy, the new industries emerging, new companies emerging, new products emerging, but the areas where you have lots of zombie firms, the economy is very difficult because the governments need to continue to support them to control resource allocation, and the Northeast China has become a big problem today. The second issue, a uh, problem with the zombie firm is uh, when you have uh, zombie firms, it's actually very difficult to, um, to, 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 to deleverage. Um, so for instance, uh, we all think the Chinese leverage ratio is too high. But what well, the government is trying to make efforts to, to rein in the, the, the leverage ratio for the non-financial cooperation, it's a very difficult. And uh, one of the main reasons is you, we did a study to show that that asset ratio for zombie firms on average was 72%, and the non-zombie firms 51%. So you know, if you can resolve, close down the zombie firms, your average um, leverage ratio actually already come down quite significantly. Because we can't close them down, it's a very difficult. And that also leads to the third issue of the problem. The efficiency is declining and the risk is continue to rise. Because these companies continue to operate, so you need to feed 
them are continuously financial resources and so on to average uh, 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 average efficiency is declining. So this actually is a one big question. The government started from a few years ago. They say we need to resolve these zombie firms, but it's kind of slow. Um, I, I can't say they're not doing anything. Some of the um, access capacity was shut down um, and so on, but it's just uh, slower than expected. But my second point about the SOE reform, um, I, to some extent, I think it's uh, slow, but we actually don't know exactly what is going to happen yet. There are policymakers and mm -hmm. scholars who feel that maybe this year uh, we're going to see more breakthroughs. Some of the cases that we saw early on that the government is st starting to focus more on the financial indicators, um, disciplining the, um, uh, the senior management of the SOE companies and so on. Maybe there will be some changes going forward. But at this, at, uh, uh, for the moment, I would say there, there could be a hope, but we don't know for sure that things will move in that direction. So it is a potentially a big risk. Uh, remaining. Um, it could be a major obstacle to um, the process I described to you earlier, on, transitioning toward the, um, the new normal of the Chinese economy. To, to me, I think the two critical areas to watch are state-owned enterprises, mm -hmm. and the other is competition policy. Mm -hmm. But on state-owned enterprises, I mean, I think there are some tests that we can erect <laughs> that we can use as a measuring stick. Um, one is, very simply, <coughs> Are state-owned enterprises in China doing the things that the Chinese government itself says state-owned enterprises should be doing? Or, as I would argue is the case, are there many, many state-owned enterprises that are not doing those mm -hmm. things, right? Um, if you listen to what some senior Chinese policymakers say, the mm -hmm. two things that state-owned enterprises should be doing mm -hmm. are, number one, they should be str in strategic industries, okay? And then second, they should be natural monopolies. But there are a lot of state-owned enterprises that are neither of those things. They're doing a lot of those th the other things. And so one question I have is, is the state prepared to shed those mm -hmm. enterprises that, and, and concentrate mm -hmm. the remaining state-owned enterprises into either natural monopolies or strategic industries? And that gets to the second test, which is, are they prepared to put some of these firms through bankruptcy? Or, as has appeared to be the case for the last few years, do they prefer consolidation mm -hmm. rather than bankruptcy? Mm -hmm. um, I have a colleague at the University of Chicago who um, wrote about one SOE bankruptcy. It's a provincial state-owned enterprise called Guangxi Non-Ferrous Metals. Mm -hmm. So there are examples, but they are few and far between. And they are counteracted by the stories that you mm -hmm. hear. And I'm not talking about central state-owned enterprises here, which are being, you know, th th there were 117 a few years ago, then it was 113. I've lost count. It's down to about 107. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the government wants national champion firms, and they're consolidating these big central firms to be globally competitive, as they see it. It's really the provincial and local state-owned enterprises that are going to be the test of reform. And as with that Guangxi case, that was a local one that went through bankruptcy. But, I mean, I, I've heard incredible stories. You know, there was one pro I won't tell you which one. There was one province that had five state-owned cement firms. It was either five or six. And one of them was a pretty good company, and the others were just garbage. I mean, just garbage. And, I mean, what did they do? Did they put any of them through bankruptcy? No, they consolidated them. So they saddled the good one with all the bad assets. <laughs> and on top of that, they created a provincial monopoly in a process. So, so they made it even worse. Um, so that, to me, is the test. And if you, I mean, it's not going to be a wave of bankruptcies because of the political questions I, I raised before about employment. Um, the conditions <coughs> for SOE bankruptcies are different than in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And when they laid off 30, 40 million people in the 1990s under Premier Zhu Rongji, they had the external lever of WTO accession there. There isn't an external lever like that now. But um, I do think there are these tests that we can use as a yardstick to at least gauge trajectory and see progress toward what I would call reform goals. And as I said, some of those are the Chinese government's own reform goals, right? A lot of these firms are doing things that are really not the strategic goals of the state. Mm. And that isn't happening. So that's mm. what, you know, <coughs> five years from now, we can look back and we can measure how they did. But I don't think the picture is very pretty right now. You talk about competition? Um, competition. 
Well, I mean, you think started to, I mean, you both started to get to when you talked about the private sector. I mean, one is competition rules affecting the private sector. The second is kind of <laughs> stealth reform of state-owned enterprises by exposing them to competition by breaking down some of these oligopolies. Um, you know, I think as an American, we hear a lot about openness to foreign competition. I do not take for granted that competition reform in China means necessarily going to mean openness to foreign competition. I could see some reforms that are designed to foster domestic competition while retaining pretty high walls mm -hmm. and lots of non-tariff barriers. And I do think that's one thing that the administration, if it were inclined to get into a serious market access negotiation with China, which it doesn't appear to be inclined to do right now, but if it were, that's one thing it would need to address is, mm -hmm. is competition rules, um, it, particularly in sectors where U.S. firms are most competitive. But I, I think, um, I think increasingly kind of reform and openness are being bifurcated. You know, under Deng Xiaoping, we always said reform and openness. Well, reform and openness. Under Mr. Xi, reform and openness seem to be becoming decoupled in some interesting ways that I don't draw a lot of conclusions from, but uh, I've seen the sprouts of some things that I think it'll make it much tougher for foreign firms. But it doesn't necessarily mean there won't be reforms including domestic competition reforms in China. Hmm. I think when we talk about competition, you know, even just domestic one, when you want to uh, make sure that the SOE compete with the private firms, you want to make sure it's fair competition. You provide a level play field, right? And, and then in that case, I would say it's probably coming back to reforms. Again, market reforms. You don't provide this kind of implicit guarantee for the SOEs or hmm. the kind of <laughs> subsidized funding or other things. Uh, for the SOE, right? So, I mean, in the end, you know, it's still, uh, there's a lot of fundamental institutional reforms that we need uh, for this economy. Um, so, uh, talking about opening up, right? Um, I, I think this brings us to uh, the third question I just mentioned, uh, the China's foreign policy um, and the foreign relationship. Um, China is uh, definitely becoming more uh, proactive, more assertive uh, nowadays, um, and um, you know, actively trying to be play a part in shaping up uh, the, the international order. Right? So, um, how this is perceived by the rest of the world? You know, especially for the Asian peers and also the U.S. Um, what do you think about that, Evan? Well, um, well, in the U.S., it's it's thrown a lot of Americans for a loop. There is no question about it. Right. Um, um, the, uh, um, you know, I I I, I worked for uh, Bob Zelik when he was the Deputy Secretary of State, mm. um, and he famously gave this speech in which he. He argued that China should be a responsible stakeholder in the prevailing international order. Um, a very good speech because, after all, the opposite of a responsible stakeholder is an irresponsible free rider. And why should the goal of U.S. policy be to encourage China to be an irresponsible free rider? So now China's stepping up in a more proactive way, and we're not so sure we like this anymore. <laughs> um, um, and part of that is because it's not, we're not so sure about what some of, what some of the goals are. Mm -hmm. and what some of the initiatives are. You know, China, um, um, China's not a, I mean, China is a revisionist power in the, in the literal sense. It seeks revision to the prevailing order. Mm -hmm. It's not a revolutionary <coughs> one. I know that because we, I, I mean, we've seen a revolutionary China before. That's what China was in the 1960s and mm -hmm. 1970s, right? It was <laughs> opposed to every global institution. It sponsored proxy movements, you know, in Bolivia and Borneo, uh, they were for Puerto Rican independence when Mao Zedong was the leader. I mean, so this is a very different China than that one. But um, I do think this question of how China's role in the world meshes or doesn't with the prevailing institutions and rules, um, what are the underlying norms that China seeks to preserve or change? It's one thing to be for order. That doesn't necessarily mean you're for liberal norms that have been built into the order. And I think that's partly what's thrown people for a loop because it's early innings on that. Um, but um, but the, the United States, I mean, hasn't responded very well to that. I mean, the U.S. in particular. The, you mentioned the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was an example of an institution that, I mean, it's, it's not clear to me that, I mean, there are going to be many battles between the United States and China over standards and institutions and norms. So 
So it's not clear that going to the mat over an infrastructure mm -hmm. bank was necessarily the right place to, to pick the battle. First, because it was going to happen anyway. Um, second, because um, there was a huge infrastructure need in Asia. And third, and most important, because it's a multilateral development bank. Mm -hmm. in which China's share in the bank will be diluted over time. I mean, the second largest shareholder in that bank, anybody know who the second largest shareholder in that bank is? It's India. Mm -hmm. And there, other than Japan, I can't think of many countries that are more ambivalent about the rise of Chinese power than India. Yet there they are, the second largest shareholder in the mm -hmm. bank. Mm -hmm. um, that is different than, say, the so-called Belt and Road Initiative that you mentioned, because it's a bilateral China-only initiative right now with somewhat hazy uh, rules around procurement and projects, and a lot of those projects are, are being steered to Chinese firms. So I think this is a work in progress, and I, I think, you know, China's a $13 trillion economy now. It's the number one <laughs> trader, number one manufacturer, mm -hmm. number one oil importer. It's not surprising that China's going to want some revision, but um, what that means for the order is, is um, it's early innings, and I think the U.S. would do better, I mean, the United States in particular, would do better to play a stronger offense instead of um, a whining defense would be the best way to put that. So, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it, it come down to the U.S.-China relation. Um, you know, we do see that most recently um, China has been the primary target of um, President Trump's, you know, protectionist mm. trade agenda, right? So, you know, just I think a few days ago his tweets about China need to get a plan to cut the trade deficit um, uh, to cut the trade surplus with U.S. by 100 mm. billion. He said 1 billion. Okay. 1 billion would be easy. Yes. <laughs> right. so, plans. Yeah. So I think, um, so hmm. the, the first thing is that from the trade perspective, um, you know, what are, what should we expect from the U.S. down the road? Uh, and and, and uh, to, to take a step back, Avin, do you think this is a justified request or a reasonable request from the U.S.? And the second one, I think, from uh, from the China perspective, Yi Ping, how do you how do you think Chinese feel about this? And <laughs> how would not China happy. <laughs> not happy? How would China? <laughs> but how would China respond to that? You know, so so in the end, are we going to see a trade war? I mean, between the two largest economy in the world, because that's going to be a disaster. <laughs> well, um, obviously, um, China is not happy um, as expected. Um, I think there are a couple of issues here. Um, I do agree on trade policy, on domestic reform, and so on. China could uh, have done better. Um, there's no denying there are issues. Um, on things like intellectual property rights, protection, and so on. I'm not saying China is doing perfect, but part of the issue, I think, for things like IP, um, you need to have a gradual process. And globally, international experience suggests that protection of IP always improves significantly when indigenous in innovation becomes a main phenomenon. That actually is happening. Um, you go to the IP court in China and you look at the, the documents, you find that 99% 90, of the cases are Chinese companies as you other Chinese companies. So it's improving, but probably not to the um, standard of developed country yet. So there are things China should do better um, a, 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 a on that. But the two other questions I think we, we, we needed to keep in mind, and that probably is why some Chinese feel a little bit uneasy. Number one, um, if you look at the um, imbalances, I mean, you, you, you think China is trading unfairly uh, with somebody. Um, that was probably a stronger case in 2007 when I said current account surplus was almost 12%. Today, it's already down to 2%. And that actually is a very normal range. There are a large number of countries have much higher external imbalances than China. So why China is still there um, to, 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 to be blamed? Now, one issue here, obviously, is uh, there is uh, some question here about uh, bilateral versus uh, multilateral imbalance problems. China's bilateral trade imbalance with the U.S. still is a very big number. 
but China runs um, actually a current account deficit with many other countries. So the critical issue happened there uh, was actually the global supply chain. China is still exporting a lot to the U.S., but a lot of materials, intermediate goods, actually from other um, Asian countries. Um, and that, to some extent, was a shifting of a su surplus from other Asian countries to China, and the, then the bilateral number looks very big. But you look at the, um, the, the global, um, as I said, the global number for China is not um, unusual at all. The second point I think for Chinese, and they feel that it's a little bit difficult to deal with is, you look at the two country, one country, the one is the US and the other is China. It's very difficult for these two countries to actually reach balance in goods trade. Because China is a, is a manufacturing center and it produces a lot, lots of manufacturing goods. But the US is stronger in services, especially financial services. So these are different things. I mean, you can't imagine the US will start to produce lots of manufactured goods and start to export it to China so that the trade, balance, the trade sector will be much more balanced. So I think we need to take a much more global and balanced view about these problems. But again, I'm not saying um, China is perfect on the trade policies and so on. I think there are lots of areas where we could improve. But it's just to pick on China because of these imbalance issues, it's a little bit uh, um, unfair. How do you think China will respond? Well, China, I think, I mean, I don't know what they, they're going to respond, but there are a couple of things you already saw, right? If, if the U.S. really imposes um, these very harsh tariffs on imports from China, um, I wouldn't be surprised if China also takes some uh, retaliation. But I think it will be very managed, very, very refrained, because I don't think China has any interest in starting a trade war uh, with the U.S. China is still a very open country, still a developing country. China probably has more stake than any other countries, many other countries in the world, in maintaining a relatively free trade system. And this, this is the, the reason why China is doing the second. Um, you probably already heard just ahead of um, uh, the, uh, the President Trump's visit last year, the Chinese government announced a very comprehensive package of opening the financial system. And uh, uh, Mr. Liu He, uh, the president's uh, top economic policy advisor, who probably will become economic decision maker um, next week, um, came to the U.S. and uh, to talk about these issues. So I think they want to take positive actions mm -hmm. trying to resolve um, the differences. Um, I, I was interested to hear you describe China as the number one target of the president's protectionism, because this week, mm -hmm. the principal target of his protectionism was, of course, Canada, Mexico, the European Union, and he was tweeting about Australia about 90 <laughs> minutes ago. So if, if you follow the president on Twitter, he was so on the phone. he's making enemy no, everywhere. He on, well, he was on the phone with Prime Minister Trump when they were talking about steel. You know, these nego every country has to negotiate an exemption now. So, um, um, so. China. Let me, everything you, what you said about supply chains and global imbalances is important and true. So let me see if I can capture the kind of gestalt of the current debate in the United States about China. Because mm -hmm. um, um, it's not just about supply chains and so on. First, I think politically, but also in a business sense, there is an underlying sense of unfairness in the US-China economic relationship that a lot of American companies and people and politicians feel. Um, and so the narrative has changed significantly in the last year or two. I mean, I've been involved with China for 30 years in one way or another, and I sense something the substructure changing in the way a lot of Americans are talking about their economic relationship with China. And the reason for that is I think there's a fundamental sense of unfairness 
that's captured by things like investment rules. The United States is, as a comparative advantage, a very open economy to foreign investment. China, comparatively speaking, is not. And so China is doing, Chinese companies are doing things in the US market, for example, that American companies cannot do in China. It's not a function of the US-China bilateral relationship. It's a function of our openness. But it strikes many Americans as unfair. And that's why this term reciprocity is entering, well, has entered into and is going to grow much stronger in the debate about Chinese investment in the United States. The idea that a Chinese company can buy Smithfield, which was good for Smithfield, and good for pork exports to China, which are up 48 or 49 percent. And China's something like 58, 59 percent of global pork consumption. If you're in the pork business, China's an important market. So on the merit. But the fact that an American company could not make a reciprocal investment in a Chinese agricultural company strikes Americans outside the context of a particular transaction as unfair. And so this debate about reciprocity, I think, is going to intensify. <laughs> the second thing is that the US-China relationship, ec economic relationship, has so many stakeholders mm -hmm. in it now that the experience of different sectors and firms is really very diverse. And so it is harder to generalize about the relationship than it was 10 or 15 years ago. If you're in agribusiness or you're in, and I don't just mean commodity exports to China, I mean mm -hmm. any business, I mean, forget agribusiness, medical devices. Right, what country is deploying mm -hmm. medical device technology to scale more than China is? And there are a lot of technologies. And so if you're in certain businesses in the United States, I live in the Midwest now, there are a medical device company in Ohio. Expansion into China is kind of an important part of your growth strategy. And so you look at the competitive landscape with China in certain sectors <laughs> differently than some of the more established companies that have done business in China for a while and having market access and non-tariff barrier and regulatory problems are facing. Mm -hmm. So what that meant, what's that, what that's meant is that the experiences are different, but also unity in the business community in the United States around China has collapsed. And that has political implications as well. Um, big firms, small firms, companies in this sector, companies in that sector, they just have different equities and interests, and they're pitted <coughs> against each other in ways that produce a lot of political contestation. All right, third, we have our current administration. Um, the, this administration is unconventional in its approach to the last half century, at least, of trade policy in some ways. Not that other administrations haven't experimented with things. I was in the Bush administration. President Bush experimented with steel tariffs, didn't work out so well. Um, um, and other things too, but the focus on bilateral imbalances that you know that they, Mr. Navarro in particular, but this focus on bilateral imbalances and um, on certain other things and is 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 different than I think what we're used to. Um, now, I think the administration's actually gotten a lot of traction with China because the enthusiasm for coercion and punishment and the threats have absolutely, as you implied when you talked about Mr. Lewis, gotten attention in Beijing and have energized the Chinese government to address some of these concerns in ways that I gotta hand it to the Trump administration were not necessarily the case before. So the question now is can you cash that check with a serious market access negotiation with China around sectors where American firms are most competitive. Services, technology, these kinds of <coughs> sectors. Um, the Obama and Bush administrations were attempting to do that by negotiating a bilateral investment treaty with China um, for a variety of reasons that, that didn't get done. Um, this administration doesn't seem interested in the bilateral investment treaty, but they have at various points expressed <laughs> enthusiasm at different levels for a more serious and sustained market access negotiation. I think if they want to capitalize on their achievements, that is the way to do it. Um, but that is not really where we are right now. Um, and so there isn't that kind of intensive process between the two countries designed to mm -hmm. remove structural impediments in China. Um, so the last two things I'd say are, number one, policy change is coming, and not just in the trade space. Watch this CFIUS mm -hmm. stuff 
in, in, in Washington. Um, whether it's the Corn Senator Cornyn's legislation exactly as he would like it or something of the House bill is even tougher. Um, there will be um, attempts to uh, fix some of the things in investment screening that I think there's a consensus now are not screened. Um, things like joint ventures as opposed to control. Um, uh, there'll be a lot more scrutiny of technology investment. <coughs> That's, that's gonna come, so there'll be a lot, and that is, that is largely about China. So there's gonna be a lot more scrutiny of Chinese investment. But out in the country, when you get out of Washington, there are still a lot of things happening between the US and China that I don't think are captured by this narrative that I just gave you. Um, I live in Illinois, I'm surrounded by states run by very business-friendly governors, some of whom have been extremely active with China. Um, I'm thinking particularly about Governor Snyder in Michigan, Governor Rick Snyder in Michigan, um, Governor Eric Holcomb in Indiana, and a few others. Um, our current ambassador in Beijing, Terry Branstad, was a very China active governor in Iowa. These governors look at China through the prism of jobs and growth for their states. Um, they, are, they are focused <laughs> on China in a different way than the Washington conversation. And so, just as I said, the business unity has kind of come apart because people are having different experiences. The state level conversation, I think, is very different than the federal conversation. And the other thing is, Chinese investment touches people in ways that they don't necessarily see. I flew out here on a United flight this morning. So my coffee service was done by a company called Gate Gourmet. Anybody ever see the trucks for Gate Gourmet owned by a Chinese company? Your, 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 your plane is clean, the cleaners, also owned by a Chinese company. So Chinese investment touches people. AMC theaters, if you've been to a theater, lately to see a movie. There's a lot of Chinese investment here that isn't branded Chinese investment and flies under the radar. And I, I don't expect that to not continue. Okay. So Kay. Evan and Yiping, I think what I heard from you is that, um, you know, I think despite all the talks and threats, um, I think from the US side, they still want to bring China to the negotiation table, just trying to get more market access for China. Mm -hmm. Well, China is certainly willing to engage in further dialogues or negotiation. So in that case, you know, a uh, lose-lose situation of trade war is pretty unlikely. Um, so um, I think our time is uh, uh, limited, so I will open to the floor for questions. Please. I have a question not so much about the climate change interval, but more the next issue that you're talking about, that, and <laughs> maybe at least not directly, a and that is I, I know some serious Chinese physicians um, are very concerned about major parameters that are going to constrain all of the things they're thinking about doing. Um, that um, the one-child policy uh, is disastrous, uh, uh, mis mis misdirection <coughs> of the, of the society, um, uh, degrading the structure of the next generation, in addition to many other things. Uh, I know there are people maybe in this room who, who have written pieces on, on, on this sort of thing. Um, and um, I was just wondering, Okay, I think I need to repeat the question for the video. Um, so it's the question is really about demographic change. Um, how would that um, affect your thoughts about China? Do you want to take a few questions if time is yes, limited and just get, get a bunch on the table? Nick. Government has seems to have asked for a golden ticket in 
what includes quasi-private transactions. So, yeah. Okay, so I guess uh, we will leave a few minutes uh, for the questions. I think uh, we got the one child policy demographic question. We got the bilateral investment treaty question. We got the question on SOE and private uh, firms and also the removal of the term limit was the impact. So. <laughs> well, um, I only know um, something about the one question and I'll leave all the others <laughs> oh, you're to, leave <laughs> the term to, um, to, to, to address. Um, the, the question, Nick's um, comment, uh, observation about uh, um, the government authorities kind of discouraging um, the Chinese companies uh, p making a foreign, um, uh, uh, purchasing foreign assets or sometimes um, encourages them to actually sell, get rid of the foreign assets. I don't necessarily think uh, just to start with that was an issue about the Chinese company making investment overseas. It was more related about the financial risks at home, partly because um, after um, the, um, the central parity reform of the exchange rate in 2015, there was uh, quite a lot of capital outflow and the intention to move money out was very significant. And PBOC had to take some unusual steps to stabilize the market. And, but but you, then you realize some of the major Chinese corporations actually making a lot of massive acquisition overseas. So that was to some extent giving the current capital cross-border capital flow management framework, that was kind of like uh, 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 avoiding uh, the restrictions and making investments. So it's number one, not entirely inconsistent with the policy framework. I think that that comes to my second point. That makes them even more worried. A large company borrowed lots of money or issuing some kind of strange financial products in the domestic market and then make investment overseas. It's kind of increasing significant uh, domestic risks. So the deleveraging, financial deleveraging, I think would have a direct impact on, on that. So they never said that directly um, that uh, this is illegal or this is not, uh, not, not a good thing. But uh, um, uh, when the pressure for currency depreciation was very significant, I think the central bank did have a policy encouraging more capital inflows and uh, slow down the capital outflows. Then I think the leverage itself caused a much bigger concern um, among the policymakers. Kind of, yeah, the demography, I'm not sure we ignored it. I, they, you know, they're getting old before they get really 
rich. And when you mentioned middle income trap, right. uh, that was part of that. I mean, I think pension reform, uh, you know, some pensions have been reformed, other pensions are unreformed. So, well, um, one of the things that, that was necessary to discuss is, is the suppressive effect on the potential for innovation as the society ages. Right. Everything you're talking about is shifting into a new mode requires huge innovation and capacity Absolutely. for adjustment, which is being shrunk at exactly Absolutely. the time it is necessary. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, this is not my idea. I, this is just the, 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 the idea that I have. Well, well sure. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, it's a major issue. I <laughs> yeah. was just surprised. Well, maybe, maybe I'll add one point. I mean, he's probably a better yeah. person to talk to you um, <laughs> later on. I mean, <laughs> aging is a big challenge for China. When the population ages, the um, saving ratio will decline. And uh, probably, as you said, uh, um, as a production capacity, that actually would decline. Um, but at the same time, I think it's not entirely unmanageable. Um, it's a big challenge um, to, to start with. So for instance, automation, to some extent, you could actually offset uh, um, the, 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 the negative consequences of, um, of aging. And the second part of the story is, uh, you, I think you're right, when the population really becomes aged, innovation becomes difficult. But you look at the process when the population is aging, you may also find uh, some unexpected uh, positive impact, that is uh, making a lot more investment on human capital. Actually, innovation could, 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 could increase. But the longer term, I think this is a yeah. big challenge in China. Has so to we are to running face. out of time. So Evan, could you really like briefly touch no. upon the rest of the right. question? So debt, the bilateral investment treaty. <laughs> I, I don't know what happened. I think part of it is they ran out of time. Um, they really got going toward the, it was really getting going toward the last quarter of the administration. Um, there was always a question of whether you could have moved an investment treaty through the Senate in any case. But toward the end of the Obama administration, the thinking, particularly in China, seemed, well, one school of thought was that it would be better to wait for the next administration. Another one was that you could set the table for the next administration by setting the, the, the basically, Mm -hmm. reaching a series of agreements that would shape the discussion into the next one. Anyway, whatever happened, the clock ran out, and I think that's not something this administration seems interested in at this point. So they'll have to find another way to do market access. The term limits. Um, well, it's early innings. Um, if you mm -hmm. had, well, all right, I guess I'd say first, if you paid no attention to China whatsoever because you were from the planet Jupiter, and you had parachuted down and begun paying attention eight days ago or nine days ago and started reading the op-ed pages, you could be forgiven for thinking that China had a highly institutionalized political system with lots of checks and balances in the system. And only last Thursday did this suddenly become <laughs> okay. Um, that is not, in fact, the case. Um, China, as I said earlier, has a one-party system run by a communist party on Leninist principles, which is not to say there haven't been important institutional changes in the polity, but at the top of Chinese politics, there has always been a lot of knife fighting and skullduggery, and so this doesn't, <coughs> this is consistent with that to me as an outsider, not knowing what happened. Um, the second thing I'd say is that when Xi Jinping wrote his thought, uh, and his name uh, into the constitution of the Chinese Communist Party at the 19th, it was clear what the general trajectory was gonna be. Um, third, if you're not a wonky political analyst, you wanna understand what it means in policy terms, I think it's early to say. I mean, on the one end, if they were serious about certain reforms, you could make the case that greater unity at the top with less politicking among vested interests would be easier to overcome those. From a long, that's a very short-term perspective. From a long-term perspective, I think it's probably very debilitating of the system institutionally. Um, I, I, I don't like these comparisons to Russia or to the, it's, it's, let's just treat it for what it is. It's happening in, a, in China in a Chinese context. I think it's early, but I think institutionally, the challenge for China is to develop a more institutionalized set of policy making and political structures. So in that sense, 
um, it complicates that. Hope that makes sense. So thank you so much. It's great uh, discussion. Um, I know you. I know that you must have like further questions, but I know that Yiping and Evan, you are going to both join the dinner, right? So you can, you know, trying to catch them. Um, one thing to remind that if you are coming for the dinner, uh, do register for the dinner and get. We need to get a new name tag so you know which table you are sitting. So thank you so much. Thank you.